sorry for the late restart. Technical issues. You go away on vacation and all of your uh, all of your electronics decide they need to go on vacation too. I I don't I <laughs> sometimes don't understand. Um, okay, so we're in session eight. If you need a copy of the session eight material. Anybody else? We're slow. Three sentences? We do a little more than three sentences. You know, there's two styles of Bible study. One, you say, okay, we're going to study the book of Romans. We'll ch cover chapter one this week. We'll cover chapter two next week. We'll cover chapter three. I don't like those. There's too much that's left unsaid. I like I like in-depth Bible studies, and I'm sorry if you don't. Um, and I know. <laughs> All right, so the Life Light Bible studies are designed to be, you notice it says day one. This is supposed to be done in a week of five sessions in a week. And it takes us five months. I didn't just say that, by the way. Um, but I, I prefer the, a little bit, okay, I'm trying to see where my last one was, day three? Okay, so this, this is the last we do, we're doing. The cross plus what equals salvation, and we said cross but nothing. Um, and we talked about false teachers guilty of denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Anytime you place something... I don't want to go there. Anytime you place something in here, other than the cross... You, you, you're taking honor away from the cross, and there you're denying that the Lord bought you. So we've, we talked, I, I guess, I have to think. I mean, I've been gone a week. I've, I've been talking to the fish, okay? By the way, for those of you that are interested, I caught a 22-inch largemouth bass. I caught a 22-inch channel cat. Yes. Um, we transferred, my brother-in-law's <laughs> pond is overflowing with fish, and so we transferred nine largemouth bass greater than 18 inches. Greater than 18 inches. Transferred nine of them to a neighbor's pond. We didn't take them all. And uh, it, it, it was interesting. I thought at first, all right, as we're taking two at a time to that neighbor's pond as we're catching them, I'm going, at what point are we going to stop catching them? The last day I was still pulling them in. So uh, Steve has too many fish in his pond, and so we are trying, rather than just throwing them to the raccoons over the dam and stuff like that, we are still trying to keep them alive, and, and the neighbor needed some. Um, anyway, so thinking about Mark 10, 45, which is on your sheet, uh, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As we look at, um, 
as we, we look at that universal salvation um, or a universal atonement, um, when Christ dies on the cross and says it is finished, who's excluded from that? Who's excluded? Whose sins are not forgiven at that point in time? Nobody. Everybody sins. When Christ says it is finished, that is the payment for all of the sin. Why do some people still get punished for their sin? They don't accept it, right? Um, they turn, turn their backs. That's another way of saying it. Sammy and I, for, for probably a year, went back and forth on the knife. Those of you that came to our Sunday morning Bible study in Romans uh, understand what I'm talking about. And I would walk over and pull the knife out of my pocket and set it on the table in front of him. And, and I'd say, whose knife is it? And everybody would say, well, it's your knife. It's like, no, I just put it there for Sammy. I gave it to Sammy. I said, Sammy, here's, a, here's your knife. Is it, is it, in my mind, is it Sammy's knife or my knife? It's Sammy's knife. Sammy, on the other hand, didn't want to take my knife, and so in his eyes, it, and by the way, his eyes were the only ones that matter, in his eyes, whose knife was it? My knife. You see, Christ's death on the cross is for everyone, but there are those that will say, no, no, A, I don't need that, I'm good all on my own, or B, I'm not good enough for it, or C, I need to, I need to earn it from you, Pastor. That, see, and there you get to denying the sovereign Lord. If God says, because of my love for the world, my, because of my love for you, I am sending my son, and if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have eternal life, John 3, 16. If God says that, what do you have to do to be saved? That's it. You know, there, there is no believes and goes on a crusade, believes and gives $10,000 a year to the church, believes, I throw, throw that one out, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, right. I was talking to a guy that his son, uh, I'm, I'm off on a bunny trail now, his son is in a, a rather large, rather wealthy church, and they started their fund drive with a dinner last year, and at the opening, the, the pastor stood up and said, all right, who will sign up at the $25,000 level? And, and the guy's son said, I, I'm just sitting there going, huh? Eight people raised their hand. Who will sign up at the $25,000 level? Everybody's sitting on their hands for some reason. Um, but see, we don't, we don't give to God to earn that, that righteousness. It's already ours. It's why it, during that commitment month, which, by the way, is going to be in October this year instead of November, because somebody's going to be gone in November, and I don't want somebody else having to preach in my absence on commitment. We're committing back to God from what he has given to us. I mean, we don't get more because we do good. We get more because of God's love. And then God asks us, in turn, to use those gifts, A, for the good of his kingdom, the good of his people, or B, for the poor, the, the lonely, the hurting in the world. And that, that's in-reach and outreach, but those are the things that he asks us to do. The cross always has a product, but it's over here, it's past salvation, that those works come in. You know, It brings out salvation, and that salvation produces in us those good works. And we always have to keep that straight, because once we want to start saying, well, if you believe and, once you say the and, I know, 
We talked about believe and be baptized. Show me where it says that if you're not baptized, you will not be saved. Baptism is one of those, all right, so we talk in the Lutheran church about mogs, not smog, mog. Anybody know what mog stands for? None of my confirmation kids do either. What? Nope. Nice try, Carl. Means of grace. What's a means of grace? We talk about baptism, communion, and the word of God. Now, what is a means of grace? It's a way that God gets into our lives. It's a way that God draws close to us. So in baptism, the, the pledge of a, a clear conscience, Whose conscience is clear? The parents? The child? Have you taken a look at an infant lately? Oh boy! They don't have a clear conscience other than they, they don't understand what they're doing. It's God. God takes that child and makes it his. That, that pledge of a clear conscience is God saying to that child, you are now mine because of what Christ has done. And so when we talk about baptism as a means of grace, it's a means in which God interacts with that child in his life, and adults too. Uh, now, I know, when we do an adult baptism, we generally will do instruction beforehand, and there's that acknowledgement of the gifts of God and all of that prior to baptism. But it's still God interacting with that, that person. It's not a good work that that person is doing the good work that God is doing in that person. Communion. Why, do we, why are we in uh, two weeks going to every Sunday communion? I mean, couldn't we just do it once a month? It'd be a lot easier on the altar guild. Or how about once a quarter? Once a year? Why do we do it every week? How many people, and this is something that has always bugged me, how many people that are sitting there on Sunday are spiritually hurting, are emotionally hurting, and are yearning for that interaction with God? Coming to communion is not doing a good work. Coming to communion is allowing to God to provide for you that spiritual food and God, allowing God to do a good work in you. And hopefully, through that food, be strengthened, your spirit be strengthened, certainly, for, uh, for this life and for eternal life. We talk about the Luther's three gifts of communion, or benefits of uh, well, baptism and communion. Uh, uh, forgiveness of sins, strength for this life, and the assurance of eternal life. And if we really believe that, then that sacrament works along with the cross, delivering that grace that is found in the cross to the person. How many of you, when you read the Bible, believe that you're walking with God? Really look at it in that way. That it's not just sitting down to read a book. By the way, I, I read a lot of books in a year. Um, some years I'll read 50 or 60 books. I really don't think about walking with the author. I look at the, the characters and, and what's going on in the characters. Some of them are historical fiction, and so I'll look at the history involved. But when I read the Bible, it's, it's a walk with God. It, it's God talking to me. And see, and that's a means of grace. God draws himself close. God is of benefit to us so that we can be of benefit to others. See, so when we talk about the means of grace, it's not displacing or denying that sovereign Lord, but rather welcoming the grace that he brings so that salvation may have a product in us. 
So when we talk about baptism, we, we practice baptism because it is a means of grace. It is a means by which God interacts with a person. So why don't we have multiple, you know, you can be baptized multiple times in your life. Many churches do. Why don't we? I mean, we're going to every Sunday communion. Maybe we ought to have every Sunday baptism. I'll stand there at the door when you come in, and I'll... <laughs> and for some people, I'll get the super soaker. <laughs> Why don't we do that? That water will well... Anyone who drinks of this water, it will well up within them and become a fountain flowing forth. Jesus' words to the woman at the well. See, we believe that that water of baptism... I, I think I said it in a sermon about three or four weeks ago when we baptized a child and I asked how many of you are still wet from your baptism? How many of you still feel that water? We should. Because that's the beginning of our relationship, our walk with God. And it's a walk that God never wants to end. And that's what that grace does for us. Any, anyone who believes in it baptized, without that without that closeness to God that comes from the means of grace, what does Satan immediately do? You say you believe. Are you sure? Are, are you sure it's not a lie? And by the way, I'm on a number of forums, religious and otherwise. Um, I, I have so many hobbies that I... I get on forums and I talk with other guys but on some of the forums they'll, they'll drop into a religious discussion and invariably somebody will make the comment well that may work for you but I, I believe that all religions are a lie and they're, they're just out to, to control you and take your money by the way how many times have I tried to control you I need to really beef up my control don't I um I need to beef up the message to steal from you, too, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like, I'm sorry that that's your understanding of religion. Because I'd like for you to know my Jesus. That Jesus that was willing to die for you. And he asked nothing of you to be worthy of that death. He only asked for the opportunity to walk with you be a benefit and blessing to you. Yes, Jerry. Can you have baptism without the ritual? I'm trying to figure out where you're going with that one. Give me a, give, explain it, please. Yes, that's why it's believe and be baptized. It's not just be baptized, um, it's believe and be baptized. Um, can you have it without the ritual? Certainly. Um, and, and there are simplified forms of baptism. Um, right. Um, and by the way, the, the little bit of water that I, I pour on the child, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, if they had dirt on their hands, it wouldn't wash the dirt off their hands. But it's very powerful because it's combined with that command of God. Um, can you have it without? Yes. How does that work? That's a bit more difficult to define. Um, the spirit works in many ways. And, and the baptism is all about spirit. And... When you get into that realm of the spirit working in somebody's life, I go back to John 3, Jesus' words to Nicodemus, the wind blows where it will. You know not where it comes from. You know not where it goes. And the spirit goes where he will and does what he does, and you know not where. And, it, it, and it's kind of... I don't understand everything that the Spirit does. I understand God's promises of the Spirit. And so I'll have to say, 
can there be baptism without, without the ritual? Yes. Because otherwise, what is baptism? Dan? It's works. It's the ritual, right? If I do it right, it's beneficial. It's effective. And by the way, there was a... In the early Lutheran church in the 1800s, I don't know if you know the history of the LCMS in uh, the United States. They came over from Germany during the Prussian Union. And when they get over here, their leader, Martin Stephan, uh, he, he messed up, okay? Uh, and I'm not going to go in. There are several different stories or rumors of how he messed up. He was put on a boat and was sent across the Mississippi River ended up in Redbud, Illinois, and was a pastor there for the rest of his life and did a very fine job. W with his leaving, he was the avowed leader of the Lutheran, church, Lutheran emigrants, uh, immigrants who came to the country. So the group that left, he was their leader, uh, trained in Germany. Now, there were other pastors that were trained in Germany, but they weren't the leaders. Two of those leaders were... Uh, Carl Friedrich Wilhelm Walther and Otto Hermann Walther, uh, and they were kind of understudies to Martin Stephan. After Martin Stephan uh, is expelled, the church begins asking the question, are we still a church? Can we do baptisms and communion? Because our representative, remember, they come from hierarchical. Our representative is gone. Do we need to send back to Germany and have a new bishop come over? CFW Walther uh, does a deep study of historical church but then also scriptural church, and he comes up with um, the with a document that talks about church and ministry. And in there, he talks about the fact that the church is wherever the word of God is proclaimed in its truth and purity, and the sacraments are celebrated rightly. That you don't need somebody's big paintbrush saying, "Yes, you're you're perfect." But that it's that you follow what Scripture says as far as the, the sacraments are concerned, and that you follow what Scripture says in your preaching and teaching. So all of a sudden, um, the church understands that as long as that Bible is used and the sacraments are are are, are uh, celebrated, they are they are the Lord's church, and so there you get that baptism becoming a, a pivotal part, the means of grace, it's whenever those means of grace are present, the church is present. Now, as I've said before, you can have a bat. So, Shelly and I are driving down the road, and a car ahead of us goes off the road, flips over, and two people are expelled from it, and a little child. And, I, and we put, by the way, this did not happen. I'm totally making this up, okay? We, we pull over, we run up there, and the lady, a lady is laying there, her head is cut and bleeding, and she says, my child, my child, and I, and I say, well, it's, your child is right here. She says, she has not been baptized. We were on our way to have her baptized. Would you baptize her? Can I baptize her? But we're not in church. I don't have my robes and my stole and my cross. I got a cross on today. But I don't have my robe and stole and cross. Oh, Shelly could baptize her. I didn't say it was a her. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the crux of the matter. Normally, this is Luther's words, normally it is the pastor who does the baptism. However, in a, an emergency, any Christian may, and it's not any Lutheran, any Christian may baptize because it's God working. 
So the effective sacrament is that sacrament that says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are those, there's a, this, this, this church really blows my mind. It's a Pentecostal church. Pentecostals celebrate what person of the Trinity? Holy Spirit. But it's Jesus only Pentecostal. I, I, somebody's mind just blew. I, I could smell the burnt. Uh, Jesus only Pentecostals, their emphasis is Peter in Acts often says, be baptized in the name of Jesus and you will be saved. You don't need the Father and the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus only. And my, my emphasis has always been baptized in the way that Jesus proclaimed and how did Jesus proclaim go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. See, to me, that command is the command that establishes baptism. Peter's just doing shorthand. Be baptized in, in the name of Jesus. And by the way, we don't have baptism rituals from the first century A.D., unfortunately. Jerry. Why do we, uh, okay, I'm going to, that child is already ch the child of God. Why, hold on a second, oh, uh, time out, okay, I, I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to go to confession. Why do we, why do we confess our sins every worship service? Is it that if we don't confess our sins, God won't forgive them? I thought I said that when Jesus died on the cross and says it is finished, all sins were forgiven. So why do we have confession? You see, the confession is for us, not to earn forgiveness, but to acknowledge what Jesus accomplished on the cross. I, a poor, miserable sinner, blah, 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 blah. But for the innocent and bitter sufferings and death of your son, you know, you get that, you go from that poor, miserable sinner to that innocent and bitter sufferings and death. And that's the, I understand, Lord, I'm not worthy to be here. But on account of your son, you count me worthy. I am not worthy to be baptized. I'm not worthy to baptize. But because of what you have said, I acknowledge that presence that you have with me. It is, it is a both and. It's for the child, it's for the parent. It's an acknowledgement of that relationship that God has already had with that child and of the salvation that was there because Jesus died on the cross. Then the, the outgrowth of that or the byproduct of that is that that water worked within that child in a way that wasn't there prior to that to grow up in and to acknowledge that relationship that they already have with their Heavenly Father. Um, we do. We, and, and by the way, I pray for my children. Um, we have, I don't know if you've noticed it, as you walk in the front door of church, there's a banner on the side that has the recent baptism, the little lamb with that name on it. And I'll walk through that church narthex and I'll stop and I'll touch each of the lambs and say a prayer occasionally. I don't do it every day. I'm not, I'm not going to say I do it every day, but when I walk through there, I'll stop and I will remember each of those children that were baptized. Well, and we talk, we talk about that in the rite of baptism, right? You know, after the child is baptized, this is the sponsors, but it's also the parents. After the child is baptized, you are to uh, remember them in your prayers, put in their hands the Holy Scriptures, and bring them to the sacrament of God's house. Uh, you know, 
we talk about that responsibility of raising up children, by the way, I give, the church gives the sponsors each a pamphlet that reminds them of that so that they can remember what they are for that child. So there is, there is a, a post-baptism responsibility, but that doesn't, that doesn't make the baptism effective. Yes. That child is already baptized before it's baptized. Yes. It, it, it puts an added responsibility on the parents, the godparent, and the congregation. Um, yes. Um, we, we don't do this here, but in the Lutheran worship uh, rite of baptism and in the Lutheran service book uh, rite of baptism, at the end of the baptism, there's a section where the congregation welcomes that child and promises to care for that child and to lead that child. Um, and... I, I like that. We've never done that here. It wasn't the custom of the church when I came in. It may become the custom of the church, if I so choose. Um, but I like it because it reminds the congregation that this child now is part of them, and they have a responsibility for that child. Jeff. Jeff. Sponsors are speaking on behalf of the child, and the congregation is speaking along with them. And I, I, I like to say it's a remembrance of your own baptism, a celebration of that relationship with God that you've had, and then a pledge toward that child that you will also follow along and help it in that faith and in that faith walk. Um, so I, I guess... Jerry, we've gone full circle, and baptism is about so much more than just the ritual. You know, the ritual is just a form, and it begins it. Um, it's a shared ownership. I, I, I want to see you go to the parents and say it's a shared ownership, and they say, okay, so what weekend are you taking this? <laughs> yeah. And I said something a few weeks ago about if, if somebody's baptized in the Mormon church, they'll get a genealogy from that person. They'll baptize everybody in that family. You know, um, and they take ownership of that family. And Martin Luther was baptized in, in the 70s. Did you hear what I just said? Martin Luther was baptized in the 70s. He's good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Huh? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. And then was it this last one or was it the third? Was it one of the Wilkes girls or was it, it I think it was on the third. That baby, I mean, she locked on everything I was doing when I was baptizing her. It's like Whoa, you know, uh, but it was, it, it, it is something that is very touching, um, and, and it's not something that's taken very lightly by the church or by this pastor, but yeah, some of, some of the kids are just anything but, um, and I like when it's sometimes when it's an older child that you can kind of look at and as you're saying things you can get through to them because um, it it means more. Uh, you know, I don't remember my baptism. I was like three months old. Yes, Jeff. Oh, have we been on track? <laughs> don't run them off.
Yes. The, the way that the baptism, I, by the way, I am not advertising baptism in the preschool. I am not uh, soliciting families to have their children baptized. I would never do that. How it's happening, and it, it is totally a, an outgrowth of the Holy Spirit, when we reopened, we determined this was going to be a Christian preschool, and Jesus is in everything we do. They have a curriculum that has Jesus built into it. And we have chapel service. We had it on Tuesday, Wednesday last year. This year it's going to be Wednesday only. It's going to be every Wednesday. But I get the chance to talk to the children. And the, the parents noticed, the, we had parents that would come to chapel. And they noticed early on that I talk to the children like they're my own children. And one of the, around Christmas time, one of the families uh, said something to me about our children have never been baptized. I believe they're Catholic. Our children have never been baptized. Would you consider baptizing them? Would your church consider baptizing them? And I said, well, you know, what do you think of baptism? And is God welcoming our children into his presence? And it's kind of like, uh, yeah, we'll do baptism. So out of that conversation, two other moms that were standing out here, this was a noontime conversation, two other moms that were standing out there approached me in the week or so after that and said, you know, that conversation made us think. The one, the, the son had been baptized in Texas when they lived there, but with COVID, they weren't doing baptisms when the little girl was baptized, or would have been when she was born, when she would have been baptized. And they said to me, would you baptize her? And that came out of that conversation with that first family. And out of that conversation came two more families, one of which had a baby back about Christmas time. And they're waiting for family to come in from out of state out of country, they're coming from French, uh, from Guyana, uh, Sammy's country, and when they come in, then the family wants those three girls baptized, and they, they again, they are Catholic, but they haven't been baptized Catholic, and it just, it is totally, the teachers talking about Jesus, me being there welcoming them, but it's the, it's the spirit working through everything we say and do um, and showing that those children are important to Christ the King figuratively and literally. Figuratively in our church, but literally Christ the King cares about their children. Christ the King. And so that's, that's how it has come about. Now I haven't approached the parents and said well we'll baptize your child but you need to jo join our church. Some of them have been coming to church, but that's not, that's not the prerequisite. It's have your children baptized in the name of the Lord and follow along. Talking to one I did, it was a private baptism, and at graduation, the preschool gave them a Bible. It was the Bible that they had read from in class, the VPK class, and then the church gave them an illustrated children's Bible, each of the BPK graduates. So they had the two, two Bibles. And I, when I was at the house of the one baptism, um, they invited me over for lunch afterwards, Shelly and I, and we went there and went into his bedroom, and there sat that Bible. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And the mom said, we have to read three stories from that Bible every night. He won't go to bed until he's had his three stories from the Bible. Now, that doesn't happen without the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's not Pastor Brown. That's the Holy Spirit. And so how it come about, it is totally organic. 
from the Holy Spirit. Am I happy that it's happening? Yes. And I, I will continue to pray for those children and for their upbringing in the Lord. And I will pray for that their parents follow in the, that footstep also. And that those, when my nieces were younger, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law went to church most often because of them. Because they would ask the question, are we going to church this Sunday? And they nagged. My nieces can sometimes do that. And so they were very persistent in, I want to go to church, and so they went. Um, they're both good Christians, and they both, uh, but they live a quite a ways from the church, and so they just didn't always make it. Um, they had lived closer, but then they moved out, out a ways, and so they, it was quite a, it, it was quite a chore to get the girls ready and to get to church on time. And I, you know, I understand that. But they, they were there because of the, the, the girls. And I, I think some of these kids are going to do the same thing to their parents. Are we going to church? Are we going to church? Are we going to church? Are we going? It's like a broken record. You know, it's, you ever have that record that's skipped and you got the same sentence over and over again? Or same phrase from the song? Um, are we going to church? 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 You know, and it's like a parrot. And I, I don't know how the Holy Spirit works. I just stand back and let it happen. You know, and we've got two more families that are slated to have their children baptized that are members of the preschool family, uh, which is our family. Um, and I, the one, I, like I said, the one won't be till October. That's when the family's coming in. The other one, it's trying to get mom to come in from New York. So New York or Pennsylvania, uh, somewhere up there. Um, and so she, they're waiting for that. But um, it will happen. So, Brian, you had your hand up. <laughs> I probably forgot it. No, he, uh, uh. Ref oh, reflect. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, hey, and by the way, uh, Claudia, we haven't made it through three sentences. <laughs> but just to say we made some progress, what is the end of false teachers and prophets? Look at Psalm four, uh, 73. Why do believers need to keep this in mind? I'm going to read Psalm 73 to you. Um, and it, it is long. We'll probably take the rest of this time, but I can say we went to question four. And that, by the way, there's one sentence, two sentences, three sentences there. Okay, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes in iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the, most, does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishment. I have spoken out like this. I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terror. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you 
will despise them as fantasies. But my heart was grieved and my soul embittered. I was senseless. I was ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into, your, into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides, my, besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. I want to I throw one word out at you. Despise. Despise. I'll write it up here. Sometimes my speech is not clear. Yeah. <laughs> I'll deal with fantasies, but despise? Think about, think about the weight of that word. What are we to God? We are, what? What word would you use to describe us? The beloved, right? My beloved. How does beloved compare to despised? Not even close, right? What the psalmist says is that those who follow their wicked ways, they're not just ignored by God. They're not just overlooked. They're despised. Forgotten. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I I don't like Brussels sprouts or artich uh, asparagus. I don't like Brussels sprouts or asparagus. I don't like. I would not say I despise Brussels sprouts or asparagus. Why not? Despise is a much, much stronger emotion. There are things in my life that I despise, but not that. When I, when I look at what the psalmist is saying, you know, to be despised by God, and you're, you're right, despised as fantasy. Fantasy is something that's not real. But God even looks at them and he despises them and says, you're not real. You're false. You don't exist. God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a lot to take in. Why? Why have you, why have you Despised to beloved from fantasy.
fantasy be real by understanding God. Now, the writer of the Psalms, I don't know if this is a Psalm of David or not. I'd, I'd have to go back and look. Um, my feet almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. See, David sees, if this is David, the psalmist sees what? Atoph? Asaph? Okay, it's just one of those liturgical psalms. Um, and so it could be anybody in Israel. But it's when your heart fancies the world, your feet begin to slip. You slip, begin to slip from that beloved to the despised. But see, uh, where is it in here? I, I'm not finding it. Um, but there, there's a... Yeah, okay. Brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. See, it's an acknowledgement that God is always with us. You guide me with your counsel afterward. You will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. My heart and flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. You see, it's, it's that realization that as beautiful as the things of the world are, as beautiful as catching a 24-inch pike or a 22-inch largemouth bass. That's not what I love. I love the Lord. And it's that understanding that keeps us from being despised and keeps us being the beloved. Um, and by the way, do we sin? No. I'll see you after this session. No. Yes. What is it Luther says in the Lord's Prayer? We daily sin much and indeed deserve nothing but God's wrath. We pray in this petition you may not look upon our sins or deny our requests on account of them. You see, we acknowledge our sin. We don't try to hide it. We acknowledge it. We acknowledge that God is God and that God is the one that uh, rules our life and forgives us our sin. Does God see our sins? No. Even in, the, even in the process of sinning, God is forgiven because they were already removed at the cross. But do I realize that it was removed? Am I thankful that I still have my thumb? Those of you that have heard the story know what I'm talking about. And those of you that have woodworkers in your family are looking at them right now going, don't be stupid. But I'm thankful to God that I have usage of my thumb. Which, by the way, is very important when you're using a bait casting reel. I'm left-handed. So what are, you, what are you trying to say? I'm sinister. I have a central, I have a central, I have a central trigger, so I push it down. I'll probably be leftist. I am, I understand I am sinister, the Latin word for left, sinistus. So, all right, we will stop there. I'm making notes for myself now. Um, we'll stop there. Think about Psalm 73 this week, and then look at day two. The reading for day two is lost. Got to get the right book out. Second Peter 2, 4 to 10. Look at those verses. All right? And we will, we will be... We, I don't think I'm going to be out of town again for a while, so...
I think the next time is like the end of September. So we've got a good long run. Maybe we'll finish up First Peter, First and Second Peter by then. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you welcome us into your family, that you call us your beloved, that you have made us to be so by the love of your Son and by his righteous act. Inspire us, Heavenly Father, by your Spirit to live lives that are holy and worthy of the calling to which you have lifted us. Help us to show forth that light and that love in our daily lives and in all things, Heavenly Father. May we, may we see you standing beside us, holding our right hand and leading and guiding us. Bless all for whom we pray in our hearts and in our minds, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for being here, and we will see you next week. We'll see you on Sunday, too.